Second John, we're going to read the whole book. Remember, it only takes about a minute and a half or so on average for me to read it. Verse 1, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is a commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. Now turn the page real quick. We're in third John. We're going to start at verse 13. I had much to write to you. But I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. Let's pray, Lord. Thank you for your word. I thank you for this time of worship that we just had through music, Lord. And now we get to worship you through hearing your word being read and preached, Lord. So I just pray that this will be a very fruitful time. pray that the students here will pay attention and listen. And may they be impacted by your word. And it's only by your Holy Spirit that they'll be impacted. It's not by how I preach. It's not by, um, you know, my delivery or personality. No, it's by your spirit, Lord. And that's what we're trusting and that's who we're relying on to um, transform lives this evening. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So for about seven years, I don't know if I shared this with you guys before, but I was involved in juvenile hall ministry out in Los Angeles. And if you guys know Los Angeles, it's known for, it's called like the nation's capital of gangs, right? Um, I'm not going to mention any of them gangs because, you know, I don't want, I want y'all to shoot me. I don't know if y'all part of them gangs. I mean, I don't know if people bang in Brentwood. I'm, I, I highly doubt it, you know. Um, you know, Brentwood ain't the hood. I don't care what y'all say. Y'all can act hard all you want, but Brentwood is not the hood, okay? But um, juvenile hall ministry, I was also involved in adult um, Ministry, um, Men's Central Jail in downtown Los Angeles. You guys probably seen in movies and things like that. Had opportunities to um, do ministry, and many of the inmates were a part of gangs. So I didn't grow up in a gang environment. I don't know that life. The most I heard about gangs was like through rap music and you know watching some hood movies or something like that. Movies that I wouldn't recommend y'all to watch, but you know I wouldn't say it growing up or anything like that. However, um, I've been, I you know became well informed on gang life and gang culture through doing ministry and interacting with. Um, you know, people within the inner city, um, in Inglewood or Gardena, Compton, or um, East LA, even in, in the valley, and also, well, more so in prison, um, in juvenile hall and in adult jails, ministries. And what stood out to me is that many of these gang members are heavily committed to their gang and the, and the people in their gang, the members of the gang. Um, they are loyal, they are committed. In fact, they're even, I would say, they're sacrificial towards their gang members. Some of them, you know, commit crimes for their gang. Some of them are doing time for, you know, crimes they didn't even do. But in the code of the street or the code of the gang is that we can't snitch. Um, and that shows you like, wow, that's a lot of devotion. That's a lot of loyalty. That's a lot of commitment um, to something that's wrong and evil. But I always thought to myself like, man. What if they were saved and they had that same devotion, that same drive, that same commitment, that same um, loyalty um, when it comes to Jesus Christ and his church and serving and, and, and doing ministry and things like that? You know, like that would be so amazing. And in fact, I actually knew some 
um, gang members who, who've gotten saved. And, you know, when they get saved, they, they get confused as to why. Like, man, how come, like, when I was in a gang, I saw a lot of loyalty and commitment. I saw a lot of, you know, even service in ways, you know, sacrificial love. But when it comes to the church, I don't see that. You know, we talk about love. We talk about serving one another. We talk about being devoted to each other, looking forward to fellowship and things like that. But how come, like, you know, when I live this one life in games and stuff, we're doing that stuff, but for wrong reasons and, and for evil. But as I got saved, you know, I'm in a church. We preach this stuff, but we don't do it. And I thought that, you know, that's actually an interesting observation. Um, it could be a fair observation, even, um, depending on what church um, they were part of and things like that. But we have to ask ourselves, you know, as a church, as believers, do we have a desire to be with each other? You know, are we committed to one another? Do we take delight in being in each other's presence? Do we even try to get to know one another? See, what's interesting about gangs, in the sense, they evangelize. They try and get as many members as they can. And, you know, in a sense, do we have a drive to evangelize and proclaim the gospel to those who are not part of the church? You know, do we have that drive? Do we have that desire? And even those who are in the church, do we show true love? Do we try to get to know one another? My prayer is that this sermon and the discussion in your small group is that it will help you and I, actually, to evaluate if we are a hospitable people, or if we are a welcoming people, if we are a, a loving people. Do we demonstrate true love? The title for this sermon is called Walking in True Love. Yes, those terms are brought up again in a different way. Love, true, truth, walking, loving, love, all that stuff, right? But we will look at three signs of what it looks like to walk in true love so that we are able to examine if we are truly are loving towards our siblings in Christ. So you could say that, oh, we love the church, we, we love Christians and things like that, but okay, this is going to be a test. Tonight, in this sermon, in this passage, in the passages that we're looking at, it's going to be a test to see if we are desirous, if we're desirous to be in fellowship. If we are delighted in fellowship, and if, if we are deliberate to fellowship. Those are the three signs. Are you desirous of fellowship? Do you take delight in, in fellowship? And are you deliberate? Meaning, are you intentional to fellowship? So let's look at the first point. True love involves being desirous of fellowship. And we see this in 2 John verse 12, the, the first part, and then 3 John 13 to 14. And now, I know it's weird. I don't typically do this, but I know it's weird that I'm preaching from two different books at the same time, all right? However, the verses that I'm talking about in 3 John and in 2 John, they're pretty much related to each other. If you heard it being read, you know it's kind of very similar. John is almost saying the same thing, so that's why I'm kind of tying it together. Of course, in 3 John, I'm not going to be explaining too much about the context. We'll get there when we come back from winter camp. Um, but I'll give a few, a little nuggets here and there, give you a little spoiler on 3 John. He says, though I have much to write to you, this is um, 2 John verse 12, though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. It said, I hope to come to you and talk face to face. And then in 3 John, verse 13 and 14, pretty much says the same thing almost. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. See, there should be a desire or a determination to be present in fellowship, to be in person. And I think we understand the effects of what, um, you know, black in-person fellowship causes. I mean, you guys remember 2020, the whole pandemic out, you know, you try to do stuff on Zoom and it's just not the same, you know. Um, you know, you need to, we need to be present. We need to be physical and, 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 and be in person. The thing, you know, that's why I'm opposed to having like some type of virtual thing going on here in, in HSM. And then you guys don't come here. You guys just watch because it's different. It's different for you guys. It's different for me because there's a lot of benefits that we get for when it comes to in present communication. See, although we have social media, we have Snapchat, you know, we have FaceTime, we have, you know, Zoom and all that stuff. Although we can see each other face to face nowadays, right? Virtually. But still, we don't have the full interaction. 
See, because 70%, according to communication specialists, I heard this statistic before. I'm sure you guys have as well. 70% of our communication is nonverbal. Only 30% is verbal. And out of that verbal communication, your tone is a big part of it. See, nonverbal communication involves so much. It involves body language. It involves facial expressions. It involves eye contact, tone of voice, demeanor, aura, or energy. Or you guys say bye. You know, you, you, kind of, you guys kind of sense the energy sometimes when you meet someone. And it's hard to describe it. Sometimes it's like a negative energy. Sometimes it's like, wow, this person, I just feel so positive around this person. Or sometimes it's, you know, you could feel weight or heaviness. Sometimes you guys probably feel that in the small room sometimes, right? Where it's just, you know, you can sense them, man, someone's really heavy right now. Or like this a sort of energy they bring could be a spirit. Okay, we talk about that in the angelology class, okay? But, you know, we, we get that. You know, we get posture. We get proximity. How close you are, you could be to communicate with someone. Projection of voice. We get all of that when we meet face to face. See, John, he, he, he wrote these letters to these individuals, to the chosen lady in Second John and Third John. He wrote to someone named Gaius. And he wrote some things that are important for them to know that were urgent. But then at the end, in, in both letters, he says, you know, I would rather not, you know, write the rest of the stuff that I want to communicate to you with pen and ink. I'd rather come see you soon face to face. In the literal Greek, it says mouth to mouth. Now, I know when you think of mouth to mouth, you think about what? Making out, all right? Or make, make CPR, okay? But um, what, what, what does the Greek imply? It means an oral discourse. It means a conversation. It means that we're going to be talking back and forth. It's the same um, expression that the Old Testament uses when God and Moses spoke face to face. They interacted mouth to mouth. And that's what we need to have when it comes to fellowship. We should have a desire to see one another in person, presence. And here's another thing that we get when it comes to in person fellowship we get physical touch. You know, what does physical touch imply? It, it, it implies affection. It, it also implies, you know, warmth or trust. A simple handshake creates some sort of social bond, doesn't it? You know, it, it, it can mean agreement. I, in fact, most, most big agreements usually involve a handshake, a contract or a covenant or, or a promise. Like, you know, it, it signifies sealing a deal most of the time, right? Galatians 2.9 talks about how, um, you know, Paul talks about how him and Barnabas received the right hand of fellowship from James, Peter, and John. When they perceive that God has called Paul and Barnabas to be ministers of the Gentiles. See, even back then they had a form of a handshake. Nothing wrong with appropriate physical touch. All right, you see in the New Testament and some of the other benedictions. You know, benedictions are like the last few verses, like kind of like what we just read. That gives like a um, salutation or, you know, a goodbye. And it, sometimes it says, you know, greet one another with a emphasis, holy kiss. All right. Or sometimes in 1 Peter 5, 14, it says, you know, greet one another with a kiss of love. All right. Now, in their culture, when, we, when it comes to kissing, it was almost like how we hug each other. All right. It wasn't anything where we see kissing, right? It's kind of like, it's very romanticized. It's kind of like, oh, you know, that's cheap or something like that. Even to this day, some cultures, Christian cultures, they kiss each other on the cheek. All right. But it's not implying anything immoral. Or flirtatious, it's a holy kiss. That's why it's called emphasis, emphasis holy. The adjective before the kiss is holy. It's a golly. It's a sanctified kiss. It's not a kiss to imply infatuation or, or romantic interest. It's a holy kiss. It was a form of greeting during that time, during that culture. And although we don't give kisses in our culture, all right, don't be kissing me. Don't don't say like hey, I want you to kiss me or something. No, I'm not talking about that. Bad time when you just walk in. Uh, <laughs> But, to some extent, physical affection, physical touch, is appropriate. Okay? It's okay to give handshakes, high fives, daps, hugs. And speaking of hugs, I'm talking about holy hugs. See, we don't do holy kids, we do holy hugs. I'm not talking about hugs where it's all full frontal for like 12, 13, 15, 20 seconds and, you know, you touch it all over. No, I'm not talking about that. All right? I'm talking about hugs in the sense that we're like, it's affectionate, it's like a sibling, brotherly, sisterly hug. So there's nothing wrong with that. This is why in person, physical presence and fellowship is important. See, sometimes people need touch. Jesus touched people to heal. Sometimes he didn't do it, which is interesting. 
But Jesus didn't need to touch anyone to heal someone. He could have just, and sometimes he did it. He said, like, yo, go be well, your, your son is healed or whatever. But sometimes he touched them. When he saw the children, he, he laid his hands on them and blessed them. See, sometimes, some, sometimes people just need a hug. You know, when we think about love languages, right? Sometimes we think about, like, oh, what's your love language? Oh, physical touch, you know, you know giving gifts or um, words of affirmation, quality time. Um, what else? Is that it? There's one more? Yeah, we, we don't know, man. I guess, yeah. But the point is, like, we need to love each other, okay? It doesn't matter what your love language is, man. Like, just love on people, okay? You want to love someone by, you know, giving them a gift, giving them words of affirmation, encouraging them, spending time with them, hugging them, handshaking them, giving them that, whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. True love and fellowship is to be desired. You should you want to come here Sunday mornings and even Thursday nights. You should be excited to see your brothers and sisters. Yeah, nothing wrong with meeting on Zoom and Snapchat, but just be real, it's so much better in person. You can even have better communication in person. That's why John had these short letters. He said, like, you know, I, I need to communicate better in person. Like, some of you guys, you guys text me these long messages. It's like, okay, just call me or at least, you know, at least call me or we just want to have a meeting. Because, like, it's too much. Sometimes you can't read people's tone through text message. You can't see their, um, their body language, their facial, facial expression. Sometimes we misread things. I misread things all the time. It's like, oops, I, I messed up. I didn't mean to say that. Or uh, I misunderstood what you said and things like that. Sometimes you just need to be present. And we should desire that. We should, we should be desirous of having fellowship. See, in, in 3 John, he says, I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink, just like how he said in 2 John. But then in verse 14, he says, I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. See, John, he, 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 he was eager. He was patiently waiting. He said, I hope to see you soon. And we could talk face to face. A true believer in Jesus will have a desire to be in fellowship. See, if you're one of those people and you, and you say, like, oh, I'm uncomfortable to be around um, Christians. You know, and you say you're a Christian, like, oh, I don't like going to church. I'm a believer, but I don't like going to church. You know, I like hanging out with my, you know, my worldly friends more, you know. Uh, why is that? You need to ask yourself, why is that, you know, is it because, I mean, it doesn't mean that you're not saved. It could be. Um, but I think it's interesting. You know, why, do you, why are you more comfortable to be around your unsaved friends? You know, why are you more comfortable being up at the club, all right, than you are at church? That's interesting to me. Right, y'all, y'all too young for the club, okay? Well, house party, whatever. Y'all know what I'm talking about, okay? Why are you more comfortable in being in a context where there's immorality and there's, you know, debauchery going on? Or you're hanging around with friends and they're making these coarse jokes, these inappropriate jokes and things like that. And the conversation that they have is all gossipy and slanderous and things like that. You're more comfortable in those settings. But when it comes to, like, oh, small group time, and we want to talk about the Word of God, we want to talk about how we get, you know, serve Him and, and live for Him. Find out who our identity is in Christ is. That bores you. You don't like being in those contests. Why is that? I don't know. You're going to have to examine yourselves on why that is. Because the reality is, at least for me, because I had that view when I was a teenager, it was because I wasn't saved. Now, I don't know if that's your case. I don't know. But most likely, I would say that's probably the case. Probably not saved. Because it's interesting to say that you don't like the family of God, but yet you say you're a son or daughter of God. You don't like your siblings, but you're fine with hanging around those who are unsaved. You're more comfortable with that. I'm not saying you can't hang hang out with unsaved people. We have to because we have to minister to them. We have to be light in front of them. We have to share the love of Christ to them. But it's interesting how there are people, Christians, so-called Christians, who don't have a desire to be in fellowship. We need a desire. That is an indicator of walking in true love. When you have a desire, when you hope to see your brothers and sisters in Christ. 
See, I, I miss, I don't know if you guys, you know, were part of a church before this and, or, you know, anything like that, but, you know, my previous church, I miss them. I'm going to see them again in April. You know, I, I'm excited to see them and, and interact with them. See, I have connections with them still. I talk to them still and things like that, but I'm excited to see them face to face. You know, some of you guys went on a Chicago trip last summer, and we got connected with, you know, the local missionary there and the church there, and we, we made some new, you know, friends. Brothers and sisters in Christ out there. And we're going to go there again, Lord willing, this summer. And I can't wait to see them face to face. That is a blessing that we should have. We should desire fellowship. But not only should we just desire fellowship, but we also must take delight in fellowship. See, true love involves being delighted in fellowship. And this see in 2 John verse 12 in, in the last part. He says, instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. And then verse 13, the children of your elect sister greet you. There should be a mutual joy that fellowship brings. Fellowship, remember, is living life on life with other, other believers in Jesus Christ. There should be a mutual joy. And Apostle John says our, our joy, likely indicating a mutual joy between him and and maybe um, the chosen sister, this is probably, um, or the elect sister, this is probably um, the chosen ladies that the, the recipient of the letter, maybe it's her actual sister, or maybe it's a sister in Christ. We don't really know. Some people say this is actually a sister church, if you have that interpretation. But remember, I believe that this is um, a literal lady, a literal sister, and they have literal children. I don't believe that these are two churches and the children are members. But if you have it, guess what? It doesn't really alter the interpretation of what I'm saying. There is a mutual joy, though, that we all have. And we should take delight in fellowship. Our joy may be made full. We may be full of joy. We, we should be rejoicing when we see each other face to face. See, there shouldn't be a reluctance. There shouldn't be like a you know, hesitancy. But I don't feel like seeing the same people on Thursday and Sunday. So I don't feel like seeing them. You know what I'm saying? No. We should be like, man, I can't wait to see, you know, sister so-and-so, my small group leader, man. You know, I don't know about Pastor Side, I don't care to see that brother, but you know, when it comes to everybody else, can't wait to see them. There should be a joy. And it should be full. You know, I think about um, the encouragement that we have here in, in, when we come together uh, with, you know, I love, me personally, I like the meetings I have with the small group leaders. Um, and even the time of prayer, we pray for you guys um, today, this evening, um, for winter camp. And when I, when I leave those meetings, like, man, I come out encouraged. I come out, like, I feel, like, refreshed, like, on, on fire. You know how you guys feel sometimes when you leave a retreat, a, a camp? You know, I kind of feel that way after prayer meetings. It's like, wow, I just feel, like, so encouraged. I, I think about Psalm 133, 1. It says, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Unity is a blessing. Unity just feels so good. When people, when we just encourage one another. See, we can complain and critique, critique about a whole bunch of things. Okay, when it comes to life, when it comes to, I don't know, ministry or whatever. But there's so much we could give encouragement to. There's so much we could give thanks, thank God for. There's so much we could just, you know, rejoice in. Fellowship is to be our delight. That's why in 3 John, in verse 14, John tells Gaius. Hope to see you soon. I want to see him face to face. True love and fellowship involves being desirous to fellowship. And being delighted to fellowship. It should be your delight. You should feel good. And you guys ever drink that drink sunny delight? Okay. When you drink that, you don't even feel delight. You know, you just want some more water. So like you feel like you're going to die. Right? It's so sweet and stuff and dehydrated, right? It's a deceptive name. But delight. You should feel refreshed. You should feel like your spirit, your thirst is quenched. That's how you should feel when you come to fellowship. So true love and fellowship involves being desirous, being delighted, but it also involves being deliberate. Being deliberate. Let's go to 3 John now, verse 15. I know we're flipping back and forth. It's probably annoying, but hey, we just flip it like this. It's all easy, right? Verse 15. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends each by name. True love involves intentionality to fellowship. 
You may have heard this corny saying before, but, but it's true. In order for you to have friends, you need to first be friendly. That's true. You aren't going to make friends being standoffish, being rude, being, you know, just, just being a piece of people, being arrogant and, and conceited. No, you're not going to make any friends doing that. There was this one lady I was talking to a few Sundays ago. I, I forgot what she looked like, what her name is. You see, look at me. I ain't practicing when I'm preaching right now. Greet each other by name. But hey, so many people have a shirt there I practice, right? But she said something that's profound, I guess, but it's pretty simple. He said, she said, um, you know, evangelism, sometimes evangelism just starts with a smile. With a smile. It's like, you know what, that's true. Simple things like that, like greeting someone. Asking someone what their name is, smiling, being approachable, being open, being, you know, being approachable and, and showing that you're welcoming could lead to a lot of things. Could, could lead to evangelism, could, could lead to opportunities to minister. See, sometimes we want to over communicate witnessing and showing love. To people. Sometimes it is just greeting them and knowing their name, like what it says here in 3rd John. Sometimes it is just a smile. Sometimes it is like, hey, how you doing? And stuff like that. Sometimes it is, you know, just hanging out with them and just taking them to coffee and then, you know, building relationships like that. It should be life on life, relational evangelism. Evangelism is one of the most effective forms of evangelism. Look, I love apologetics. I love you know, looking at arguments and things like that, but you need to be relational. See, true fellowship needs to be deliberate, it needs to be intentional. You need to, you need to make it a priority. And we have to remember, too, that making friends, okay, it takes time. It takes time. You can't, you can't rush relationships. You can't rush into thinking, like, oh, I made a friend today because I just knew this person's name. And you just like, no, it, it, it takes time. Sometimes it, it, it's, it's awkward. Sometimes a uh, first impression is just weird. And sometimes you can't have a sound and, you know, reliable judgment on first impression. You ever meet someone and you thought, like, man, that person is, like, kind of rude or kind of a jerk. But it's really that, oh, that person just... You know, it takes a while for them to ease into um, relationships and being comfortable. Sometimes you have to just be patient. I think about my first date with my wife. This is like maybe, I don't know, like six years ago or something like that. And we went to BJ's. My wife is more reserved and shy. I took her out. You know, it was an awkward day because I'm talking most of the time and she's just getting her grub on. Eating her salad, trying to be cute. You know, girls, they just want to have salad on their first date. You know, you want to eat burger. You know, she was still hungry after her, I'm sure. Um, you know, it's just why it's so awkward. And then afterwards, I just feel like, man, maybe this ain't the one. We're not going to paddle out. Well. Although we both love the Lord and we serve and things like that, we don't have much in common. You know, I'm over talking about WWE John Cena, and she's looking at me stupid, like, like how old are you? You know what I'm saying? But, you know, I decided, like, you know what? Let me take her out again. Let me do a second date, and then it got better. Dates got better and better and stuff like that. And it's still getting better and better. So you're still growing. You're still growing and learning, um, you know, understanding your wife, you know, over and over again. That's the same thing with friendships. Same thing with anything. It's kind of like when I first came here. Like, man, when I first came here, I thought it was a huge mistake. Like, the first two to three months, I didn't like being here. I didn't really like this job. It was difficult. It was hard. But, you know, as time progressed, oh, I love it. And I still, I'm still growing and loving it. I'm still growing and owning it and understanding what's going on and loving you guys. You guys are starting to love me more. At first, you guys were talking junk all the time, but now you guys are doing a little better, right? She's like, no sight. But the point I'm trying to make is that love is progressive. It, it grows. Relationships, that's how it is. We have to be attentional. We have to understand that we have to be delivered because we're commanded to greet one another. And he even says, you know, the friends greet you. That This shows you too. He says in verse 15, peace be to you, the friends greet you. It shows you that, you know, there can be mutual friends that get developed through friendships that you create. I know it doesn't make sense, but you guys know how it is on, I think, social media, Facebook, or Instagram, or like, you got all these, this one person, all these mutual friends, you don't even know who this is, all right? You know, but in the body of Christ, we, there's so many connections from all over, right? Like, it's funny how I talk to some people, and they know some people in LA up here. It's like, oh, that's awesome. You know, that's super cool. So here, it seems like Gaius has some friends that John knew. They had some mutual friends. And then John tells them to greet their friends each by name. And I know this is hard for us to do. I know a lot of you guys are so caught up in your little cliques. You're so caught up in the comfort, you know, being comfortable with people you know and things like that. Here's my thing. 
You talk about you're going to go out and witness the people. You talk about you're going to go out and evangelize and do mission trips. But how in the world can you do that? You can't even do it within these walls, in this context. How in the world are you going to try and fulfill the great commission? Go out and make disciples of all nations, but you can't even say hello to your brother and sister in Christ. How is it that on Sundays or Thursdays or whatever, you just walk past somebody and don't even acknowledge them? How is it that we have people sitting in here in this amphitheater? I ain't sitting by nobody, right? And it's okay. Some people, they won't sit by themselves. But how is it that no one goes up and acknowledges them and says hello to them? Now, how, how bad would it be if something terrible or horrible happens to that individual? And then we wonder, like, oh, man, I wish I would have loved that person. You know, how, 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 how does that happen? How, how in the world can we not do a simple commandment of greeting one another? See, here's my thing. If you're having issues with fulfilling this commandment, you probably have issues fulfilling some of the harder commandments that God has. We can greet one another. We can, we can, have, we can have a more, more you know, hospitality-minded church, which is what we're trying to do. That's one of our values. But we can't go, go around preaching gospel culture and things like that, and we're not a welcoming church. See, I, I've talked to some adults, some individuals here at the church, and they told me straight up in my face, it's not a welcoming church. Ooh, ouch. There were some students that came here, and they told me, like, uh, you know, Thursday isn't really my thing, but it's not very, you know, welcome. Oh, man, it's very hurtful, man. But it's real talk. So what can we do? Something you need to think about. What can you do to stop that from happening? What can I do? I try, and, I try to do what I can do, but it can't just be one person. It can't just be small group leaders. It's got to be you students. You guys have to make your mark. You guys have to go out and do this. And you might wonder, like, man, what, you know, what if I have social anxiety? You know, what if I shot? I understand that. You know, what I would do is think about, well, for, of course, prayers. Yes, I know that. But also think about why, why, why are you anxious socially? Okay. Is it an actual disorder? Because if it's not a disorder, okay, what are some things that you can work on? Is it because you're a perfectionist? Is it because you have, um, you're worried about what people think about you? You have these insecurities and things like that. Just want to encourage you, man. Try and focus on who your identity is in Christ. See, people, they might look at you and judge you on what you wear, how you look, and things like that. But God, man looks at appearance. God looks at the heart. That's what 1 Samuel 16 says. God looks at the heart. If you're doing God's will, if you're going out and trying to greet people and get to know them and minister to them, God will bless you for that. You have to also understand that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, that's what Scripture teaches about each and every one of us. God wants you to look, look like how you look. God wants you to sound, God wants you to talk, God wants you to have, you have that personality exactly how you are. And God wants to use that. Okay, we all have insecurities. We all have social anxiety to some extent. I have some insecurities. And I, you have to understand that you need to have your identity in Christ, who you are in Christ. And, and Christ will use you, you know, for a long time. Even you know, sometimes now, I get insecure on how I speak, so I love this, I said I struggle with that. Growing up, I had to take speech class, you know, you know, therapy and things like that. It's a lot better, but it was worse as a kid, trust me. But I can't focus on that, because like what God told Moses, who created the mouth? God. You know, maybe God has this for me because it'll keep me humble. It's like a thorn in the flesh or something like that. I used to be insecure about how short I was. All right, but God wanted me this short. And I'm still out here again. I got me and my wife and my brown sugars, you know what I'm saying? So it's all good, you know? So we all have, I'm, I'm just sharing that because, like, don't think when I'm preaching this, I got it all together. I don't understand. I get it. Okay, we all have insecurities. That's part of, that's part of the fall. That's part of pride. That's part of sin. We all struggle with those things. So don't try and make an excuse as to, like, oh, I can't fulfill this commandment because of this, because of that. Like, you know, it might be harder for you. But have you prayed the prayer of like, Lord, help me to be more hospitable. Lord, help me to be more bold and greedy people who I don't know. Lord, help me to be more welcoming. And I understand, you're going to click with people who you have more commonality with. If you're a sports person, you're going to hang out with people who like sports. If you, you know, play Pokemon, you're going to hang out with people who play Pokemon. If you're a Swifty and you listen to Taylor Swift, you're going to hang out with Swifties. If you like the Niners or a certain sports thing, you know, I understand that. Okay, if you're in band, you're going to play with band. But... When you're in the lobby and you have that little circle, your little group, if someone was to enter into that group, would you be welcoming? If someone, was to, if someone new came into your small group, whether it's a, a new co-leader or whether it's a new student, 
How are you going to welcome that person? How are you going to greet that person by name? How are you, how are you going to take delight in that person and, and show the love of Christ to that person? How are you going to do that? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about how simple ways like that is a very impactful form of ministry? Maybe your, I guess your God's will for your life isn't to preach. Maybe it isn't to go out and be a missionary. Maybe it's not to be a big time evangelist. Maybe it's not to, you know, um, lead in worship and, and music and things like that. Maybe it is to be in a greeting ministry. Believe it or not, the greeting ministry is very short. They are the for people surprised. Why is the greeting one another commandment the most overlooked commandment in Scripture? Why is it the most avoided commandment in Scripture? Because in our culture, especially in American culture, we're all about ourselves. And guess what? As believers, we can't be like that. We can't. We have to be others for you. If this was your first time coming here, whether you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, you have to think about how would it feel if I am brand new here into this ministry? How would you feel? Would you feel welcome? Or would you feel like, you know, you know people don't talk to me? And I know what, what that's like. You know, I used to come here about 10, maybe 10 years ago or something like that. Ran I was like 19, 20 years old or something like that. And, you know, I, I never really felt welcome either. You know what I'm saying? That's why nobody remembered me. You know what I'm saying? But I could, and you could say like, well, you should have did your part in trying to, you know, greet people and things like that. Yeah, that's true too. But this was my house. I'm a visitor. So, what can we do? What can you do? How can we create a gospel culture within high school ministry? How can we be welcoming? How can we be hospitality-minded? Personality types or flaws is no excuse. We can fellowship with one another. We, could be, we should be desirous to be in fellowship with one another. We should take delight in being in fellowship with one another. And we need, need to be deliberate to fellowship with one another. How can we fulfill the Great Commission if we can't do the simple command? If you're a believer in Christ, this is your call and this is your application. Some of you guys are like, oh, you know, y'all need some more application, you know, in the sermon. Well, here's a homework for you. Okay, I know we're on a winter camp. Okay, but you can do this at winter camp, but you can also do it when we come back on a Sunday. Try and greet someone you don't know. Be awkward. This is what God challenges us to do. Be awkward. Ask them what their name is. Introduce yourself. Shake their hand. I try to make that home for me every single week. This church is so big. You try and introduce yourself to someone and learn something new every single Sunday. And some of you guys can do this every single Thursday because you're still caught up in your own clip. And you got to be careful. Sometimes our small groups could end up like that. got to be careful with that. All right, that's the homework for you believers. For those of you guys who aren't saved, I want to welcome you guys into the family of Jesus Christ. See, God is the ultimate person with the greatest hospitality. Because originally we're enemies of God. None of us would allow the enemies to enter into our home and let alone be with our family. But God does that. He invites us to come to him through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins. He died on the cross for our sins. We don't deserve to be in the family of God. We don't deserve to be in his presence. We don't deserve eternal life. But God is a loving God that he invites you to come to him and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Despite your sin, despite being an enemy of him, despite breaking his law multiple times, he invites you to come to him and be part of the family of Jesus Christ. And I pray that once you enter into this family, that God will use you to fulfill the great commission of like ministering and preaching the gospel, but also welcoming others and being hospitable and greeting others. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Although it's kind of an uncomfortable topic to talk about because it's not a familiar topic, Lord. I pray that as students, as small group leaders, as leaders in the church, Lord, we're able to minister to people who are different from us, Minister to people who are like us. Minister to people who are outside of the church, Lord, and in the church. We need to greet each other. We need to desire fellowship. Live life with one another. We should desire to see each other face to face and take delight in that. And God, I pray that we'll greet each other by name. 
yeah, this is a big church, Lord, but that's no excuse. We could work on it. We might forget each other's names sometimes. We might, you know, forget people's face even sometimes. But Lord, help us to have a heart of hospitality. And Lord, I just pray for those who aren't saved. Pray that they'll come to you in repentance. In Jesus' name, amen.